Sabbath blessings and peace to you all. And for those who are worshiping online, Sabbath peace to you as well. Have you ever harbored a fugitive before? Don't raise your hand if you have. (laughs) Have you ever uh, helped somebody who was held captive to free them from slavery? Has anyone ever done that before? Maybe in the country that you came from, you help to free somebody from slavery. You help somebody to escape from slavery. The history of Downers Grove Village gives compelling evidence that, that its most prominent pioneers were a part of the Underground Railroad system. Founders of Downers Grove Village helped to free slaves. All the way from Aurora, there's this main uh, branch of the underground railroad system that would run from Aurora all the way to to Chicago. And those that were fleeing slavery would then head up into Canada. The, The pioneers of DuPage County, Downers Grove, a part of the underground railroad system. The Downers Grove Museum has graciously given me a copy of some of their research that that give claim that the Blodgetts, pioneers of Downers Grove Village, the Blodgetts helped with people who were fleeing from slavery. They harbored fugitives and uh, they fed them, gave them a night or two of stay, and then helped them on their way to their next station in the Underground Railroad system. The Blodgetts, as well as Pierce Downer, of which this village is named after, Downers Grove is named after Pierce Downer, the Blodgetts and Pierce Downer, abolitionists, they facilitated the freedom for slaves. Now, would you be a willing participant in freeing someone who was enslaved? Could it be your mission to have and show compassion to the one who is desperate in need of help? Jesus, Jesus was a guest speaker on Sabbath in a synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. Nazareth. But believe it or not, he gets kicked out of that synagogue. <laughs> he gets run out of town, actually. A scroll was handed to Jesus as he's the the guest uh, teacher of that day. And he begins to read from Isaiah, and specifically Isaiah chapter 61 in, in our Bibles today. Jesus talks about the coming Messiah's mission and how he himself is a fulfillment of that prophecy. Jesus is on a mission. So what makes Messiah's mission so difficult is that Jesus is dealing with his own people. Messiah has to deal with God's own people, the very people who have a religious lineage and publicly profess to be followers of God. These people are the hardest to reach. Within God's people are religious leaders who have hardened their hearts, making it seemingly impossible for God to, to save them, people in the church. But Messiah's mission is not impossible. Mission, impossible. You've heard of those, the series of movies, right? In popular culture, is a series of action films, or if you're old enough, a TV series, Mission Impossible. I know the theme song is running through your head right now. Reports say that Mission Impossible is filming its seventh film right now. It's been delayed because of COVID, but it's starting to ramp back up. The seventh installment of Mission Impossible. And just like previous films, the film has an impossible task full of twists in the plot and turns in the storyline. 
the main character, Ethan Hawke, and his team are presented with the impossibility. Your mission, should you accept it, is to... (laughs) And then it tells them the mission. And oh, by the way, this message will what? Self-destruct. In five, four, three, two. Jesus is the main character for our world today. He is our hero, and he has a mission, and that mission is possible. It is not impossible. Praise God, Jesus has accepted this mission. And and instead of a message self-destructing, this message is preserved in Scripture today. Is that good news? The past several weeks, we've been on a series of messages entitled Messiah's Mission. It's based on this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 61. And Jesus, his reiteration of it is found in Luke chapter 4. In fact, open your Bibles now to Luke chapter 4. Jesus is repeating this mission from Isaiah chapter 61. And in order to get a good context of Messiah's mission... We take a few steps back of Isaiah chapter 61 and we take a running start at it. We started with Isaiah chapter 57 several Sabbaths ago. We learned that Messiah's mission is to rescue the backslidden. Isaiah chapter 58, we we learn Messiah's mission is to tell of true worship, a true fast. We learn in Isaiah chapter 59 that God is wanting to close the gap of separation between you and Him. In Isaiah chapter 60, Messiah's mission is to be a blessing even to the unbelievers. And so now we find ourselves in Isaiah chapter 61, of which Jesus is talking about. And so when Jesus reads this, we we find in Luke chapter 4, turn in your Bibles, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, Jesus has handed a scroll, and he's beginning to quote Isaiah chapter 61. The problem is that Messiah, in the time of Jesus, was expected to be a liberator, someone who would free God's people from Roman rule. At that time, yes, there were issues of poverty, just like we have issues of poverty today. At the time of Jesus, there were issues of grief and depression, just like today. Yes, even during Jesus' time, there were issues of people being imprisoned and even imprisoned wrongly. And yes, even during Jesus' time, there were those who were blind, both physically and spiritually. And and there were those who suffer with illness. And so, just like in Jesus' time, we, in our time, suffer with with those same things. But what is culturally more important for God's people in Jesus' time was that grip of Roman rule. The government of their time had such a grip on them. The expectation of the people toward the coming Messiah was misplaced. Misplaced such that when they confronted with the real Messiah, Jesus Christ, they were offended and moved to throw him off a cliff. They misinterpreted the mission of Messiah. So when this lowly rabbi stands up and he reads from Isaiah 61, As if he were the Messiah, we read here Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 16. So when he came to Nazareth, where he, Jesus, had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, 
to set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Verse 21. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, for any good Bible student, this is good news, right? Because you've been anticipating Messiah. But maybe you missed Messiah's mission. It had to do with the poor. It had to do with the brokenhearted. It had to do with those who were captive and blind, those who were oppressed. That's what Messiah came to do. So Jesus says, hey, today, this reading is fulfilled in your hearing. Verse 22, so all who, who bore witness of him and marveled at the gracious words which were proceeded out of his mouth, and they said, is this not Joseph's son? <laughs> Isn't this the son of a carpenter? I remember when he was a young kid playing, and he's claiming to be Messiah? But then Jesus goes on in verse 23, he said to them, you will surely say to this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Verse 24, then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath. Pahath, <laughs> Zarephath, sorry, in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Verse 27, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah, Elisha, the prophet, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. So when Jesus says these things, he's, he's talking about some of the Older Testament stories of how God's people thought that God was supposed to come and help them and save them. But apparently in the, the stories that Jesus was quoting in the Older Testament, the people who were being saved were, were not God's people. They weren't the Hebrews. They weren't the Jews. The object of, of salvation in the stories that Jesus just said there in Luke chapter 4 were were Gentiles, unbelievers. Well, when the people in the synagogue, especially the religious leaders, hear this, they are offended. What are you talking about, Jesus? Isn't salvation for us? Salvation can't be for the unbeliever, the sinner, the Gentile. But apparently this is what Jesus is teaching. And then we find there in verse 28, so all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and they led him to the brow of the hill in which their, their city was built that they may throw him down over the cliff. <laughs> and then miraculously, verse 30 then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. It wasn't just the mission of Jesus to save the believer. It was his mission to save the unbeliever. The one who does not look like you. Messiah's mission is to help save the one who doesn't even think like you or, or talk, doesn't have the same accent as you. Messiah's mission is to save the one who doesn't vote like you. This is the mission. Oh, it offended the people in the church. And they ran Jesus out of town. Messiah's mission is to bring salvation to all people, not just the Jews. 
He came to this earth to liberate all the people, Gentiles, the Romans even, the Syrians, the widow, the sick, the poor, the lonely, the prisoner, the prostitute, the drug dealer, the bully, and yes, the politician in the swamp. He came to save any who would humble themselves before him, willing to claim him as their savior. But the religious leaders of Jesus' time were stubborn. Hmm. In what way are you stubborn toward Jesus? Are you afraid of Jesus transforming you more into his character? Is identifying with Jesus and following him faithfully, does that seem boring to you? Is being a fully committed Christian embarrassing? This morning, are you spiritually stubborn? Because those religious people who were spiritually stubborn, they went to church. (laughs) They were in the presence of Jesus. They heard his teachings. They witnessed and maybe even experienced some of his miracles. Yet they were still stubborn at heart. Why? (laughs) Because they were worshiping their own expectations. They were worshiping their own sense of comfort their own sense of peace, and so they chased Jesus out of the church along with the mission of Messiah. Yet, if we accept Jesus, if we accept his mission, our faith is stretched, right? Faith stretches you. If it doesn't stretch you, it's not faith. If we accept Jesus... Our faith is stretched and it grows. Our love for Him and others grow. Our sense of satisfaction, our sense of purpose matures. And so, Isaiah chapter 61 gives a description of those who are involved with Messiah's mission. Turn now to Isaiah chapter 61, of which Jesus was teaching out of Himself. So maybe you've read these first few verses in Isaiah 61 before. But I want us to take a look at a few more verses later on in the chapter. And it's important for you to be able to see the movement of what God is doing here in Isaiah chapter 61. There's some key words here. And God is describing those who have taken on Messiah's mission. There are some key words here. If we look at verse 4, and they, the they are those who are partnering with Messiah's mission, all right? And they shall what? They will rebuild the old ruins. They shall what? Raise up the former desolations. And they shall what? Repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. So we find here that people who are partnering with Messiah's mission, people who claim to be God followers, God believers, they're construction workers (laughs) of sorts. They're repairers, they're rebuilders. They raise up the former desolations. These are people who are active in repairing what was torn down before. Well, we find in, throughout the, the book of Isaiah, the things that were torn down were worship to God. God's people were welcoming in other forms of worship. They were worshiping idols. They thought it was cool to be like the other nations, so let's worship this God like they do, and, and maybe we'll still keep our own God. Others in the God's, uh, throughout the book of Isaiah, it d- depicts God's people just walking away totally from God and, and worshiping themselves. Worship to God was torn down. The walls of Jerusalem had holes in it. It needed repairing. The temple was in disrepair. It needed rebuilding. The character of God was torn down, ripped apart. 
misrepresented. And so we find here in Isaiah chapter 61 that that people who are in partnership with Messiah's mission are ready to bring back true worship to God. They're, They're ready to model what it's like to live godly lives. And by the description of verses 1 through 3, not only do they rebuild walls and repair the temples and bring back worship, they also preach good tidings to the poor. Because the Spirit of the Lord has anointed the Messiah to preach good tidings to the poor, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. People who partner with Messiah's mission minister to the poor. They minister to the brokenhearted. They minister to the captives, those who are spiritually blind. They're willing to visit those who are in prison, those who are lonely. They're willing to bring a spirit of healing, not just physically, but also spiritually, to those who are spiritually sick. For those who are depressed and sad and who mourn, they bring comfort. And this description in 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 chapter 61, verse 3 to give them beauty for ashes. Isn't that awesome? In Bible times, this this imagery of ashes, when you are in true mourning, sometimes you'll you'll, you'll rip your clothes symbolically uh, in grief and in mourning. And then you'll take ashes and and you'll put it on yourself and, and you look really pitiful. When people see you, they know something's not right. That person's mourning. Do you know somebody who is not right and who is mourning, who is struggling, struggling with sadness, with depression? It's like they're, they're oppressed. And Jesus says he will bring beauty for ashes, oil of joy for the mourning, a garment of praise. Hey, these are party clothes. Are you okay with that? Isaiah chapter 61 says, God is going to give you some party clothes. Joy, garments of joy to wear. This is Messiah's mission. Especially in a time of COVID. This type of ministry is needed. When we are transformed by Messiah, taking on His beauty, taking on His joy, taking on His praise and glory, hmm, when our sorrow, our sadness, anger, and bitterness, when all of those things have been put to the side, we are fulfilling the mission of Messiah. Messiah's mission. Are you willing Are you willing to partner with Jesus in ministering to the marginalized, the people on the edges? Messiah's mission, are you willing to partner with Jesus in ministering to the disenfranchised, those who have been rejected? Messiah's mission, are you willing to partner with Jesus in ministering to the neglected? Are you willing to minister to those who are poor, not just economically poor, but maybe even spiritually poor. Maybe you find yourself in these categories. You've been abused. You've been oppressed. You've been held against your will. You're suffering. And you want to be free. You want to be free of the negativity. You want to be free of the anger and the bitterness.
Messiah's mission is to set you free. This is what Jesus is all about. And for me, this is what I want my church to be all about. Jesus desires to liberate you from the sin's grip and and cause you to be free in Him, free to fry, fly like on eagles' wings. <laughs> Isn't that great imagery? To be free. And if Jesus has set you free, you are free indeed. Now's the time, church family. Now's the time to partner with Jesus, Messiah. Desire of Ages, page 239. Our standing before God depends not upon the amount of light we have received, but upon the use we make of what we have. Can I repeat that again? Is that all right? Desire of Ages, page 239. Our standing before God depends not upon the amount of light we have received, but upon the use we make of what we have. The amount of light that God has given to you, use it. Let that light shine. Don't hide it under a bushel. Don't just let it sit on a, on a shelf in a back room. Whatever God has given to you, whatever understanding, whatever talent God has given to you, use it for His glory and not your own. The context of this quote is meant to call each believer to action. The action of ministering to the last, the least, and the lost. God's people are to be a blessing to the other with what they have. I wonder, church, I wonder if we are willing to partner with Jesus in His Messiah's mission. Are we willing to help those who are tired to reach out those, to those who are lonely and sick, those who are sad, those who are bitter and backslidden. And can we continue to help our, our sister churches on the south side of Chicago to help those who are in a food desert, to help be the hands and feet of Jesus and to those in, in, in neighborhoods who are suffering? Are we willing to partner with our brothers and sisters in those neighborhoods? Are we willing to fill the food pantries across Chicagoland? Are we willing to be a part of a conversation addressing homelessness? Are we willing to be a part of a process that creates jobs, helping our, our neighbors and our neighborhoods be healthier? All of these things are meant to move us towards Messiah's mission, because that's what he came here to do. Not just to minister to you, but to minister to them. He died for them. There is so much as a church that we have yet to do. We've done some things, some good things, but there's so much more that we can do. However, there are many in our church that are so disconnected from Jesus, they end up hardening their hearts, just like those who ran Jesus out of a synagogue. <laughs> there are those in our midst who have spiritually stubborn hearts, and we worship our own expectations of what the church should do, how the church should do it, and when the church should do it. When it comes to Messiah's mission, every member needs to be on board. Church family, are you on board? Are you willing to participate in Messiah's mission? Will you join me? Can we have a serious and reasonable conversation about what Messiah's mission might look like in this church? I can't wait till COVID is over. Can, can, we, can we pray for an end of COVID, this whole COVID season thing to be done and, and we can even move forward face-to-face -face in ministry Amen. with people who are suffering? Can we, can we look forward to that time? 
but maybe there's something that we can do right now through a phone call, through a text message, and reaching out to somebody who is lonely, somebody who is suffering, and offer them the good news in Jesus Christ, that there is peace, that there's love, there's mercy, there's forgiveness. There is hope in ultimate justice in Jesus Christ. Are you okay with that? I'm wondering if there are youth teenagers, young adults in this church willing to represent God's just character in an unjust world. Are there young people here willing to to partner with Messiah's mission? Our pioneers in Downers Grove took a stand for justice for the slave. And we can keep that legacy of biblical justice for all people not just for ourselves, for all people. We can start by making a personal personal commitment to adopt Messiah's mission into our hearts. We can even memorize Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. And we can keep that mission first and foremost in our lives. Are we a people willing to minister to the poor, the disenfranchised, the brokenhearted, the blind, the captive, the lonely, the hurting. Is that who we are as a church? That's what I want my church to be, and I hope you're willing to join me in this journey to fulfill Messiah's mission in Downers Grove, Seventh-day Adventist Church. How many of you want to partner together and make this mission happen with the power of Jesus Christ. Is that you today? Let us pray. Lord, oh, what a wonderful God you are. To recognize that we have been in that position of poor, we may still be poor. Oh, what a wonderful God you are to to minister and to reach out to the brokenhearted, to the hurting, to the captive. (laughs) Lord, we have found ourselves there as well. You're reaching out to us. And Lord, if you have set us free, we want to reach out too to those who are captive, who are hurting, the last, the least, the lost. Would you please give us hearts of compassion and love Would you please order our days, our lives in such a way that we can reach out to those in need of you. May we be so filled with your love and your compassion to the overflow that others may be blessed by your love and your compassion. Lord, this is who you are. This is who you are. This is your mission Thank you, Lord, for your word and how it challenges us to be a part of your Messiah's mission. We want this to be our mission. Thank you, Lord. We pray all of these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.